I'm uh, I'm really enjoying uh, the whole controversy um, that uh, is recently unfolding with Substack. I mean, you 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 seem to have pissed a lot of people off just by uh, daring to write for yourself on another website. I don't know. I I feel like that should. Isn't that like the most basic thing that you could possibly do in journalism? I don't, I don't know what's going on here. I, they, please fill in the blanks for me because I, I feel like I'm tripping. Well, you, first of all, let me just, if you don't mind, just take a moment to do something that is unrelated to your question, which is I want to um, give a warm welcome to this creepy little DNC operative, Bernie hating worm named Matthew Dimitri. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but he just like spends all his day trolling left wing web uh, YouTube programs in order to ah. take 60 to 90 second clips out of context and to create the most deceitful image of what people are saying possible. He loves your show in particular and he loves me. So I'm certain he's probably watching live probably will watch two or three times in the middle of the night as well. And what's amazing about it is not just that there's a DNC operative who does that because they're a dime a dozen, but really stupid and slothful and gullible kind of soft leftists think that he's presenting accurate clips and will therefore construct entire shows around them without bothering to check the context. I think like 50%, for example, of Sam Cedar's uh, show is based on this little wormy, creepy operatives, uh, deceitful edits where they'll like do 30 minutes accusing you of the gravest things without even bothering to check the context. So <laughs> I do want to welcome him. I think his work is very important. Um, and since I know he's watching, I felt like it would be the courteous thing to do. Well, you know, it's funny yeah. uh, what you ask because like um, when I first started writing about politics you know i had i wasn't trained in journalism um i had been trained as a lawyer and that's so why you're as it. i started taking it yeah well probably yeah that i didn't go to columbia journalism school and never got you know infected with the new york times mentality but i did once i started taking it seriously try and find models that i you know wanted to emulate and obviously like noam chomsky was a big influence you know in terms of like just how i started viewing and thinking about foreign policy and uh, constructing propaganda, but from a pure journalistic perspective, the person that I clinged on to was I.F. Stone. You know, I spent a year reading every single newsletter that he ever produced. And for people who don't know, he was like this radical leftist who got accused during the McCarthy era of being a communist agent. And he used to work for major newspapers and, you know, realize the constraints that mm -hmm. it imposed were far too suffocating. And so what he did was he created a newsletter. He was like a Substack or a blogger before either existed. And he would work out of his home and he would mail his sub his newsletter to, you know, 60,000, 70,000 um, subscribers. He would live off the subscription income. His wife was the only one who helped him. She would do the mailings and help him out. And he would basically just do nothing more than like, he, would, he didn't have sources inside the CIA that he took dictation from. <laughs> He would just deconstruct media reports and government reports that nobody was reading but that were public in order to inform the public about how they were being propagandized and deceived. And he was like a hero of the left. There's a, a prize named after him, the IF Stone Award, the Izzy, for independent journalism maintained by his family through Ithaca College that I've had the privilege of. I, I won the debut award with Amy Goodman and then was ultimately installed with like Jeremy Scale on the Hall of Fame. So it's so ironic that that model of journalism, which is emancipating yourself from corporate structure and purposely doing journalism in the most independent manner possible where you're constrained by nobody or nothing and are kind of doing this sort of journalism that's designed to dispel corporate propaganda was once venerated on the left and now is regarded as something to be embarrassed about because in the Trump years, the left reacquainted itself, mostly liberals, but even parts of the left with the glories of CNN and MSNBC and the New York Times and the Washington Post, which are their allies along with the CIA and FBI in opposing Trump. So it's so fascinating, this dynamic that now if you're off on your own, it's actually considered a source of I don't know, like uh, shame or a lack of credibility as opposed to what it ought to be regarded as, which is an incredibly important freedom, especially if you want to dissent from prevailing orthodoxies. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, they they go further than that. It's not just, oh, you're doing something bad. You're, you're killing, you're destroying journalism. 
I mean, wow. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that journalism, well, I, look, I mean, when I was a kid, the first, you know, time that I had a kind of uh, realization that everyone on TV is a bunch of liars was the Iraq war, right? This is kind of like the solidifying moment that I've that I've always uh, uh, remembered. And I think I think that was kind of a period where they should have started doing, you know, you know, the fact checking that they just decided to abandon. And they've all announced that they've rescinded this. I mean, how did that emerge from the Trump era and not from the Iraq war? Like you would think after starting a war, they would, they would uh, you know, based on lies that they would now take the time to actually do their job, which, which again, it, it's kind of astonishing in of itself because you'd expect them to do that regardless in the first place before killing a million people. But like, <laughs> no, that's just a Trump derangement syndrome thing. And now it's okay, we're going to put it to bed. And, uh, you know, everyone does Substack as a terrorist. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's funny. Um, you know, this is one of the reasons why I positioned myself the way I did during the Trump era. I mean, obviously, it would have been extremely easy to just scream about the orange fascist threat over and over. It would have been good for my career, good for my financial yeah. status um, and for everything else. Tons of people thrived and prospered by doing nothing else. In fact, people who were completely discredited, you know, had their careers and reputations rehabilitated by doing that. It was the easiest path to success. But I had a very similar path to you, even though I'm like a couple of years old, older than you. Or I don't know, maybe you're a year or two older than I am or roughly the same age. But, you know, when <laughs> in 2001, 2002, I really wasn't paying that much attention to politics before 9-11. It was like I, I became an adult in the 90s and it just politics seemed very low stakes. You know, it was after the fall of the Soviet Union. It was the Clinton years. Um, the news was dominated by things like the Monica, Monica Lewinsky scandal and, you know, Bob Dole versus Bill Clinton in 1996 and, you know, Paula Jones and just all of that. And it just all seemed very kind of uninteresting and trivial to me. And I devoted my attention and my intellectual energies elsewhere, um, you know, to building my constitutional law practice and the like. And I, you know, was one of those people. I lived in Manhattan. I was a professional. So I subscribed to the New York Times. I subscribed to the New Yorker. I subscribed to the Atlantic. And I would read them, you know, I'd read the New York Times every day and, you know, those magazines each week. And I assumed that as a high end news consumer, I was getting the basic picture of what was happening in the political world. And it was only once I started writing about politics in 2005 full time, which I did because of a narrow set of issues that had alarmed me. It was the Iraq war combined with the assault on civil liberties that very few people were paying attention to. They were imprisoning American citizens with no charges, you know ones detained on U.S. soil. They were just, George Bush would declare them an enemy combatant and, and they would be put in a military brig. The thing I thought was always like a red line, right? That you couldn't be imprisoned by your own government without due process. All of that was happening and very few people were sounding the alarm. So I started writing about politics just from those narrow issues. And once I did, once I had kind of the luxury of spending my time as my blog got popular and I was able to earn a living, I also realized how radically I had been deceived, you know, by absorbing all this propaganda through osmosis. And there was kind of a reckoning after the Iraq war on the part of these major outlets. They had to, right? They had endorsed the, the most destructive lie of at least a generation that destroyed a country of 26 million people and destabilized the Middle East, gave rise to ISIS, all of that, killed huge numbers of people. And they had kind of a reckoning where even like the New York Times said, yeah, you know, we weren't skeptical enough with our intelligence community sources. We were taking what they were telling us, giving them anonymity and putting it in headlines with no investigation. And we can't do that anymore. So I thought that that would cause reform. And then also when I did the Snowden reporting, you know, I thought that that would further foster a kind of skepticism about these intelligence agencies that, look, you thought the Internet was going to be this free, liberating instrument. But in reality, the NSA and their allies have behind your backs with no democratic accountability, converted it into the greatest tool of monitoring and surveillance and coercion known to human history. And that created yeah. a lot of resentment toward the security agencies. Well, and all that mm. progress was lost when first they kind of hyped the threat of ISIS as the threat of Al Qaeda was dying and they needed a new Muslim enemy and ISIS served that role, even though ISIS was created in the vacuum left by the Iraq war. But then most of all, it was the Trump era and, you know, the re resurrection of the Russia threat and the claim that Putin was taking over, fascism was taking over. <laughs> and that resumed this kind of revitalized this model, pre-Iraq war model, 
where media outlets did little other than get calls from the FBI and the CIA and the NSA and Homeland Security, and they got told what to say, and they wrote it down without investigating it or scrutinizing it, and then blared it as news, except this time liberals loved it because it was being done in service of their political interests, which was undermining Trump. And I'm not really quite sure how long it's going to take to recover from that, but the reason I'm at Substack instead of at The Intercept and believe that, journalistically speaking, my top priority is to promote and empower and elevate independent voices is precisely because this extremely corrupting model of journalism has returned, thanks to Trump, thanks to Russiagate and 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 similar patterns. I'll just give you one quick example. You know, there was that humiliating debacle this weekend where the New York Times, NBC, and uh, and the Washington Post all reported the same false story yet again, which was that the FBI had given a defensive briefing to Rudy Giuliani in 2019, where they supposedly told him that he was being targeted with a campaign of Russian disinformation. He went to Ukraine anyway, and it was completely false. It never happened. The FBI never briefed him. Now you could say, okay, it's not that big of a deal, but it, it's not maybe a big deal from the substance of it. But how did all three of these media outlets that constantly tout their re editorial rigor radically get the story wrong in the same exact way and at the same exact time. It's because yeah. their model of journalism is the FBI calls them and tells them something. They 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 serve as stenographer for it. They write it down. They publish it without verifying whether it's true. And they're all getting the same lies from the same, you know, security state hovels. And that's what modern journalism on a corporate level is. Hold on. Glenn, are you telling me that the United States has state media? What? <laughs> Surely that can't be state. true. <laughs> and a deep state, which, I mean, this is probably going to be the clip that that scumbag is going to take. Oh, look, Richard Meadows <laughs> and Glenn Greenwald endorsing the idea that there's a state media and, and there's a deep state and it's not Fox News, but, you know, CNN and MSNBC and the New York Times. But yeah, yeah. I mean, the idea, it's so funny, you know, the the one of the first articles I wrote after Trump's inauguration was an article headlined the deep state goes to war with the elected president because it was obvious all the way back then that the CIA was intent on destroying his presidency. Chuck Schumer even inadvertently threatened it on Rachel Maddow, kind of gave away the game when he said Trump's being stupid because the CIA will destroy you if you confront them. Yeah. An amazing addition, right? Um, and really ignorant Republicans like Rush Limbaugh had never heard this phrase before and began crediting me with it. And so did stupid liberals who thought I had invented it. When in reality, it's been an incredibly important concept in left-wing political science and foreign policy scholarship forever. Like if you don't believe there's a deep state in the United States, you understand literally nothing about post-World War II politics and history in the United States. No, I mean, I mean, this is really... I thought I, I really thought that this was extremely abundantly clear, uh, given, you know, again, your reporting on Snowden, because, you know, I, I, I had always known from my parents that, you know, the, the NSA is actually <laughs> uh, r running the show and, um, you know, more than people think. And you actually proved that you literally came along and proved that with Snowden. And that made me very happy. And actually, this actually I knew who you were before I even knew who you were by name. Right. And and because it's it's one of those big stories of the of the last decades where it's showing you look the you know these big tech companies they're working uh, hand in glove with the state and you know it's uh, it's just a continuation of what we saw with with the Iraq War where you have all these uh, corporate conglomerates working with uh, the government and and people can't seem to can't, can't seem to understand that this is you know happens under every party there's no difference here it's just decorum and I find this astonishing we have to keep repeating this. Um, you know, to me, what, what was, what's really messed up is that now they don't even bother, uh, deleting their lies. They just publish, you know, lies and they don't even bother correcting it or, or they just say, oh yeah, well, you know, it was a mistake, but you know, we, we have, uh, Stockwell back in the eighties, I think it was just telling on camera how the CIA would just, you know, run, uh, false stories to journalists and they go to one embassy and another and just feed them. Uh, crap and knowing full well that a, that a journalist will come along try to verify the story and you know that networks of journalists running um, Fake stories for them. So I mean this is not something new. I'm, I'm I don't understand why people uh, They won't step out of it. You know, they just they they don't want to unplug Glenn 